scripture reminds us to seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. But how can we do this on a daily basis? In this series, we're exploring Crosspoint's core value of earnestly seeking God. Together, we're training and practicing in spiritual disciplines like Bible study, prayer, fasting, and Sabbath rest. Together, we're focusing on the disciplines that draw us into a deeper relationship with God and strengthen us spiritually in all areas of life. Together, we're being equipped as passionate followers of Jesus to renew our community and world for Christ. Hear these words of the Lord from the Gospel of Matthew. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath." Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue, and the man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls in a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as the sound, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. In 1996, my wife Beth and I and our three young children made the journey to move from Scottsdale, Arizona to West Michigan to a little small town called Byron Center that was just south of Grand Rapids. This is a really strong Christian area. And I'll never forget our first Sunday in Byron Center. Everything was closed. We weren't used to that. All the restaurants were closed, the, um, the, everything but the churches. The supermarkets were closed. The gyms were closed. There were no sports teams competing. There were no uh, practices. Everything stopped because it was the Sabbath. And at first it took us a little bit of getting used to until we realized this rhythm is amazing. Because there was nothing going on, there was no expectation that we would be engaging in anything except for the worship with God's people. And so we began a rhythm that was just an incredible blessing for our family. We loved it. As time went on, we were there for 21 years things changed. By the time we left, everything was open on Sunday. Everything was open on the Sabbath. School teams and, and AAU teams were practicing and having tournaments. Everything in West Michigan reflected 
what we see in other communities around the country. But as wonderful as it was, there was also a level of legalism in this honoring and celebrating the Sabbath rest. And it was, it was very interesting to me because people, if you had a job that made you work on a Sunday, everybody or lots of people would look down on you. If you went to a restaurant or, or a supermarket on a Sunday, even in my last months there, if you were to go there on a Sunday, you would be criticized by many because you were causing other people to work. There was a certain legalism that had set in. I remember one time I was coaching my son's soccer team, and one of the little boys that I had, I think they were nine or ten years old, he came up to me at practice and he said, we saw you running on Sunday. (laughs) And I, you get it, I didn't get it at first. I'm thinking, well, I don't think you saw me running. <laughs> and, and then it started to dawn on me. I probably was the discussion of their dinner table that night, the pastor who ran on the Sabbath. And I said, well, where did you see me? He said, Granville. I said, oh, I would never run in Granville. I said, um, but I walked away from that recognizing and realizing that for many This was still a stumbling block. And what I love is, is what we see in this passage this morning. But what we see here is this amazing reminder that Jesus gives to us. And we see it in uh, part of this in the Matthew passage, but in a similar passage in the Gospel of of Mark, we see it more extensively. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, for us, for people, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath is to be a day that's seen as a gift to us. It's not to be a day of legalism. It's to be a day of resting in the Lord. And we're going to see that this morning in an incredibly powerful way. Because I think so often what happens when we look at the fourth of the Ten Commandments, which deals with the Sabbath, and we're gonna, I'm going to read it in just a moment, but when we look at that command, what we do is we focus on labor and work. And we want to know what is work when God wants us to focus on the word rest. That's the purpose of the Sabbath, is resting in Jesus. And so, as we look at this command, what we see is that we are to remember the Sabbath. Now, for us today, the Sabbath would be Sunday for most of us. We are to remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. As we read these words, this is the command. This is the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. It comes from Exodus 20. Let me read this to you. And I want you to get a sense of why God has commanded us to take a day of rest. To take a day where it's different from all the other days. It's a day where we step out of normal life and we step in in a particular way to celebrate the rest that is ours in Christ. Listen to what we read in verses 8 to 11. This is the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. The seventh day, this day that most of us look at as Sunday, this is to be, this is to be a Sabbath unto the Lord. It's a gift unto the Lord. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days, here's the premise, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in it. But he, what did he do on the seventh day? He what? He rested. He rested on the seventh day. 
Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, some of us, we love to work. And taking a day of rest, taking a day in which we are taking a step out of our normal pattern of life to rest in the Lord, that is something that can make us feel guilty. That's what I felt when I first moved to Michigan. What do I do? I, there's nothing I can accomplish today. Everything's closed. And so we had to learn the pattern. I had to learn the pattern. How do I learn to rest in the Lord? You see, God did not create us to work and work and work and work and work. He created us to work, yes, but to rest in the Lord. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to look at this, and I want to begin by telling you what happened with regard to this command. The religious community, they focused on what does it mean to work? What does it mean to labor? It says that I'm not to labor, I'm not to work, so what does it mean not to labor and not to work, and how can we know if somebody is breaking this command? You saw it in the passage that, we, that Rick read to us. Now, when you look what the religious community did, they looked at Exodus chapter 31 and Exodus chapter 35. And from those two chapters, they developed a list of 39 categories of work and labor. 39 categories. Here's some of the things that they, that they drew from these two chapters. You're not to plant, you're not to plow, you're not to reap, you're not to gather, you're not to sift, you're not to cook. Can I hear an amen, men? Amen. We are not to cook, not to sow, not to tear, not to tie, not to untie, not to trap, not to measure, not to erase, not to start a fire, not even to extinguish a fire. That's all considered part of what it means to work on the Sabbath. 39 different categories. Now, in every category, in every category, there were a number of things that rules that they came up with, hundreds and hundreds of rules in each of these categories. Let me give you, I mean, and some of them are just crazy. I want you to, um, here's one that has to do with planting. You are not to plant. So, under that category, and under planting, they had all these rules. You could not drop water on the ground. You could not spit. Because if you did, there was a chance that that water could land on a seed, and that seed could one day become a plant. This is what they did to try to be obedient to this fourth command. Now, on one hand, we kind of roll our eyes, but on, another, on the other hand, I mean, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? They were very, very serious about seeking the Lord, which is our value, earnestly seeking God. What I want to say to you today is I believe, as Jesus suggests or teaches us in this passage, that the religious community missed the point. We were not created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for us. It's a gift to us. But it had become an incredible burden to the people. And we see that in this passage. And so this morning what we want to do as we are looking at our core value, as a church we have seven core values, and the core value that we're looking at in this, series, in this series is how do we earnestly seek after God? And I want to suggest to you that biblically one of the ways that we do that is by honoring the Sabbath as a day in which we rest in the Lord. And we're going to see that in this passage as Jesus teaches us and at the end of Matthew chapter 11 and chapter 12. As you're going to see, Jesus runs into conflict because he is helping the people and the religious leaders to understand that the religious community had missed the point. That the Sabbath is about resting in the Lord. 
the emphasis isn't just on what is work, what is labor, what is toil. We can back away from that. We can ask the question, what does it mean to rest in the Lord? And we'll see that connection here this morning. What I want you to see here is the Sabbath rest, the gift of the Sabbath rest. Friends, we were not made to work constantly. We just were not made for that purpose. We can't do it. We'll burn out. We'll grow fatigued and we'll get sick. Our bodies can't handle that. God created us so that we are to live in this rhythm of six days of work and a day in which we rest in the Lord as our primary focus. Now that should be our focus every day. But the seventh day, the Sabbath day, is a day in which we rest in the Lord. And so we want to understand what that means. What we see here, Jesus reminds us, he says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, Jesus in this passage, the first thing he does is he and his disciples are walking through a grain field and they're picking the heads of grain to eat. And the religious leaders are infuriated. Jesus, you're supposed to be a rabbi and yet you allow your disciples to work on the Sabbath? And then Jesus heals a man whose hand was withered and he restores it so the man's hands now both work and they're identical. And what do they attack him for? They attack Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. In fact, six times in the Gospels, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. That, in the mind of the religious community of the day, is considered work. Can you believe that? That's considered work. You healed somebody on the Sabbath, that's not appropriate to do on the Sabbath day. But then Jesus says something that, that really makes them angry. He says that he is Lord of the Sabbath. Wow. What does that mean? It means that he is the one who will establish what is right and proper on the Sabbath day. It means, what Jesus is saying there, is it means that he is the one who is the authority over the Sabbath. He is the authority over how we are to live. He is the authority, not the religious community. He will establish what is proper and what is not proper because he is God. And we read later what happens at the very end of that passage. The religious leaders leave Jesus and plot how they might kill him. What Jesus is doing is very serious business. But he wants us to have a proper understanding of the Sabbath, of what it means to honor the Sabbath. And so let's look together at, this, at the first five verses, and let's see together what happens as Jesus and his disciples are walking through these grain fields. Here's what happens. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and to eat them. When the Pharisees, the Pharisees are one of the largest um, groups of religious leaders of that day. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Now Jesus is going to challenge them on that assertion. They're saying, you are allowing your disciples to do something that is unlawful on the Sabbath. Now, unlawful according to who? Unlawful according to the laws of man. But Jesus is going to point out, not unlawful according to the laws of God. And he gives them two reasons for that. Here's the first one. Jesus answered, verse 3, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for priests. So Jesus 
reminds them of a story from the Old Testament. The King David is probably, arguably, the most beloved of all the people of the Old Testament. He is the great king. The, great, the Messiah will come from his lineage. The Messiah will come from the line of David. David was ruling at the height of, the, of Israel. And so these were the golden days. And so Jesus says, do you not remember the story of David? David was running from King Saul who wanted to kill him. And so as he and his men were running, they, they became very hungry, and they came to the house of the Lord, and they went in and they asked the priest for food. The priest, the only food that the priest had was 12 loaves of bread. Now, here's what would happen. Each week, they would bake 12 fresh loaves of bread before the Sabbath, and they would place them in the place of worship, each loaf representing one tribe of Israel. They were consecrated, these loaves of bread were consecrated to the Lord, and only the priests could eat the bread. But what happens? The priest says, I have nothing else to give you, but here, eat this bread. The men were hungry. David was hungry. And they eat the bread. What is the point that Jesus is making? God did not, God did not punish the priest. He did not punish David. He did not punish the men. God was not God was not violated by what they had done, and everybody went on their way. What Jesus is showing them is that mercy is greater than sacrifice. That love, that love matters. And so when Jesus heals the hand of the, the man's hand that was withered, it is an act of mercy, it is an act of love is a service that matters for the kingdom of God, that matters for eternity. And he's drawing a comparison to that. He entered the house of the Lord, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Verse 5. Here's another example he's going to give. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath day on Sabbath duty in the temple, desecrate the Sabbath, and yet are innocent? What is he saying there? He's saying the priests work on the Sabbath. According to your logic, he's saying to them, they are desecrating the Sabbath by providing worship for the people. I work on Sundays. I am not desecrating, I am not desecrating this place of worship by working. God has called me to work on the Sabbath as a way to bless the people of God. And the same is true for all those who serve the Lord on this Sunday. And so God is showing them, hey, you priests, you priests who are attacking me, you work on the Sabbath, and according to your own laws, according to your own logic, you are desecrating the temple. You are desecrating the place of worship. And so Jesus pushes back on them, and he shows them, he points them to a mirror, and he shows them, you're wrong. You're wrong. But Jesus gets in trouble when he says that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Listen to what it says. Jesus says in verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I determine what is right or wrong, Jesus is saying. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The purpose of the Sabbath is found in me. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, when he says son of man, you see in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus often refers to himself as son of man or son of God. What is he doing there? Son of man, I am fully human. Son of God, I am fully God. And he's reminding us of his nature. He's reminding us of who he is. Now, here's the next thing that I want you to see, and that is that the purpose of Sabbath is rest. 
And that rest is found only by faith in Jesus. I want you to really stay here with me because this is critical. In our Bibles, if you look, if you have a Bible in front of you, or um, you'll see that it's broken down into chapters and verses. That's not how it was originally written. Originally, it was written as just one solid letter. And people later came and broke it into chapters and verses so that we could refer and we had reference and we could refer to specific teachings that way. It's beautiful. But sometimes I think they have broken the chapter in the wrong place. I believe that the end of chapter 11 belongs to what happens in chapter 12. I believe Jesus is referring to the Sabbath. I believe Jesus is referring to all the laws that have been placed upon the people. I, re- I believe that Jesus is talking, as he talks about rest and being the one in whom rest is found, and then they go immediately into the grain fields and are confronted by the religious leaders, Jesus, all of this ties together. All of this belongs together. The purpose, the purpose of the Sabbath is so that we would have rest. Remember what we read in the, in the Ten Commandments, looking at this fourth commandment in Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Most of us are asking the wrong question. When it comes to the Sabbath, we're asking the question, what does it mean to work or not work? The question we should be asking is, what does it mean to rest in the Lord? What does it mean to rest? In Hebrews 4, picks up this theme and uses a Greek word which means Sabbath rest. The point is to rest in the Lord. What does it look like for us to rest in the Lord? And we see it begins in this passage at the end of chapter 11, but where we read, Jesus says, come to me, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Now, burdened by the laws, these laws that the religious community forced upon them, but burdened by life, weary by life. Are you weary this morning? You mean, you could have gotten 10 hours of sleep last night and woke up this morning weary. Because it's not just about sleeping, it's about rest. It's about rest for our souls. And I'm going to define what that looks like in just a moment. What we need and what Jesus provides through faith in him is rest for our souls. And it's something that we need to connect with one day a week as a primary focus of our lives. Rest for our souls. Come to me, Jesus said. All you who are weary and burdened, and I, I, Jesus, will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Yoke is the purposes of God, the will of God for you. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, what does it say there? Rest for your souls. Friends, I want to say to you, rest is not about sleep. Rest is about resting in the Lord and knowing that my life belongs in his hands, knowing that he is in control, knowing that I belong to him forevermore, knowing that there's nothing that can separate me from his love. But as I live life and as I get banged around by life through sickness and death and and pressure and stress of work and stress of life, relational struggles, as all of that pours upon me, I forget who I am, but even more importantly, I forget who God is. And I forget about my relationship with him. And when we do, we are burdened and heavy laden, and we will never find rest. Jesus goes on, and he says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. My laws for you, they are natural for you. My laws for you are easy. The burden that comes from that, it's light because it fits who you are. When when our kids were uh, growing up, Beth and I tried to teach our kids that the laws of God, the commands of God, they're good. They're a gift. The Sabbath is a gift. 
But I remember when we lived in West Michigan, people telling me, uh, who are older like me, telling me about their experience growing up with very rigid laws about Sabbath and how they hated Sundays. There was no sense of, of rest. All it was about was not working. But the point of the Sabbath is that we would rest in the Lord. The point of the Sabbath is that we would open our hearts to Jesus in ways that we never have before. Look, I, I did a, a, a study on what the word rest means in, in terms of biblical language. It's the experience of relief. Relief from what? From fear. Relief from what? Relief from legalism. Relief from what? Relief to become not who people claim me to be, but who God has made me to be. It, we find relief in rest. We find release to be free. We sang about freedom this morning, to be free in the Lord. I am most free when I am living as I was created to live, in obedience to God's laws. I am most free when I am more of what God made me to be. That's rest for my soul, because all is right. Peace, refreshment. Oh, I love refreshments. Whether it's food or whether it's rest in my soul. Whew. I'm reminded on the Sabbath as I open my heart to the Lord, as I respond to the invitation of Jesus, come to me, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your soul. Rest that just brings refreshment and perspective. Because you see, when I rest in Jesus, when I focus on Jesus, I'm reminded of who I am, and I'm reminded of who he is. I'm reminded that I'm loved, even though I, I'm a sinner, I'm reminded that I'm loved. I'm reminded that I have value. I'm reminded I have purpose. I'm reminded I have design. And I'm reminded that what the world says about me is not true. All that matters is what God says about me. That's where rest is found. Rest isn't found in taking a nap because you can wake up just as stressed as when you fell asleep. Rest comes when I'm reminded of who God is. Rest for my soul. Have you ever woken up in the morning and you're just as tired as when you fell asleep? And your heart's pounding because there are stresses and pressures that you have to face. They didn't go away during the night. But when I rest in the Lord, when I focus on the Lord and what he has to say about me, when I come to him, what happens is I'm reminded of who I am. I'm reminded that I belong to him. I'm reminded that he loves me. And maybe nobody else in the world loves me, but he loves me. And he knows me better than anybody else in the world. The purpose of the Sabbath, it's a gift of rest. We see this in Hebrews 4, 1 to 3, which is an amazing passage. Listen to what it says. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. Now he's going to talk about it later. He calls it Sabbath rest. Listen to what it says. Since the promise, the promise of entering his rest. What's that talking about? I believe it's talking about Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. Live the life I created you to live, and you will find rest for your souls. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news, the gospel, the gospel good news that Jesus died for us, that we might live with him and in him, and that through us he might accomplish his purposes. For we have also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, speaking of people who were before us. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith 
of those who believed. Believed in what? Believed in Jesus. Now we who have believed the gospel, that Jesus died for us on a cross, those of us who believed enter that rest. We enter that rest. He, um, as he did a long time later when he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts to the Lord. This is an extraordinary passage where he's talking about the Sabbath, the Sabbath rest. Friends, the Sabbath is, I do not believe the Sabbath is, is principally about not working. I believe it's principally about resting in Jesus. And so how do we do that? Well, for most of us, Sundays are our day of rest. And here's the passage that talks about a Sabbath rest. There remains then, this is still part of that Hebrews passage, there there remains then a Sabbath rest for who? The people of God. This is after Jesus. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example, the people before us of disobedience. So how do we rest in the Lord? I'm gonna give you some, just some different ways to do that as we close. And as I do that, what, here's my challenge for every one of us today. This series is not about just about theory and and theology, as important as all of that is. It's theology that leads to action. It's understanding God's design and purposes and then doing something about it. So I want to challenge each and every one of us today, both those who are here and those who are watching online. I want to challenge you to look at your life on Sundays and begin to build a pattern for your Sabbath rest. So here's, here's what, we, uh, what I want you to see this morning. First of all, the question is, what will help you to rest in Jesus? Here's the first one, worship. Worship, you're doing it now. What happens in worship? I gather with other people of faith and other people maybe who are, who are seeking to understand what we believe as Christians, but we're, we're trying to understand what, what God wants to say to us. When I come to worship, as I sing songs, I'm listening to what God wants to say to me. As we pray, I'm listening to what God is saying. As we read the word, I'm, I'm listening to what God is saying. We worship. We're focusing on God. And here's what happens, folks. When we focus on God, God gets bigger and my problems get smaller. God gets bigger, I get smaller. I don't have to live for me anymore. Worship, fellowship with God's people. We fellowship with God's people. It, it, it says here, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. Isn't that what rest is? Refreshment? You see, when we love one another, we are re- not just refreshing them, but we're refreshing ourselves. So we gather with other believers. It's a very appropriate thing to do. Now, you're not going to do everything I'm going to give you, but I want you to think about one or two or three that you can begin to practice in your life. Reading or studying, memorizing, memorizing, reflecting on Scripture. Maybe what you do is you take time to start memorizing Scripture. We give you a passage every week to memorize but maybe you're going to take a chunk of scripture and every, every Sabbath you begin and you go back and you, and you memorize it because when you're memorizing scripture, you are feeding your heart and your mind in a deep way. Prayer, we're going to talk about that more in a couple of weeks. Prayer, coming to God and, and putting my life before him. Fasting, we're going to hear about more about that next week. Fasting is feasting on Christ. That's what it is. We have also enjoying creation. Are any of you just, is creation speak to you, any of you about the power and beauty of God? Boy, it does me. Man, when I look at the ocean, I'm like, whoa, God, you're amazing. When I go to a forest, I'm just like, God, you're so amazing. You made all of this. You created all of this. Truly resting 
Yeah, it's okay to nap. I give you permission to nap. I give you permission to nap. Serving. Jesus said to them, if any of you has a sheep in our passage, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Doing acts of service is very appropriate on the Sabbath. Friends, I want to challenge you as we go from this place today. If, you're, if you live alone, wrestle with what can your Sabbath, what can you add to what you do on a Sunday that will help you focus on Jesus? If you're in a family context or a roommate context, talk together. What can we do together? What can we do? Listen to your children. What can we do to celebrate the Sabbath, to find refreshment, to be released by focusing our hearts and minds on how good and wonderful God is? Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would give us strength in a culture that pulls us in so many directions. We're exhausted. We're worn out. Father, we need, we desperately need rest. We need, Lord, you to come and to speak to us about things we can begin to do that make you bigger in our lives and push away the things that we believe that aren't true about us, about our world, about you. Release us, Lord. Help us to find refreshment in you. Help us to find rest for our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.